A critical flaw has been discovered in Jenkins allowing arbitrary file read and remote code execution. I wanted to learn more about exploit development, so I spent the last few days analyzing the vulnerability and developing an exploit. Since I don't see a Windows exploit available, I took the challenge of developing it by myself. This is the first time I do this for a real CVE, so there are a lot of trial and error during the process. Most tutorials out there will show you the finished product, but don't really show the countless nights of pain and agony in making it work. In this series, I will show you everything I learned from low-level networking to advanced ways of crafting HTTP requests, from Java code analysis to binary-level troubleshooting, and so much more. Before starting, it's best to set the expectations from this series. Since this is my first time doing this, there are things I might be doing wrong or other ways of doing it better, so feel free to call it out on the comments below. Like every other hacking videos out there, this may attract bad actors, but it is not my intent. I publish this not only to share knowledge about programming, networking, and application security, but also to show the process on how I arrived at the final exploit. In order for me to learn on my own, I didn't use the existing Linux exploits as guide, but instead I just relied on the vulnerability analysis from Trend Micro and other sources such as Python library documentations and Jenkins source code. To make it easier to develop the exploit, it is best to have a working example which you can get back later for comparison. In the Trend Micro page, they says that exploitation can be achieved by using Jenkins CLI, which you can download from the Jenkins server. While this is enough to trigger the exploit, as I said on earlier part of the video, I wanted to learn more about exploit development and create something that is more customizable using a single script. And trust me, there are a lot of things you will learn when you develop something like this by yourself. I already downloaded the Jenkins CLI, so let's run it. Let me explain what happened. Since this is a jar file, we can run it using standard Java command. Then we specify the target server and port. Jenkins CLI is used to interact remotely with Jenkins. That means it supports several commands. One of them is who am I, which tells you your current permissions. The vulnerability occurs when you pass the following payload to the command. That happened because the internal library caused a file to be read if preceded by an at sign. You see here that we were able to read some part of the license RTF file, which is a common file on any Windows machine. The vulnerability also tells us that the amount of data exposure depends on the command used and credentials supplied. So let's rerun same command this time supplying a Jenkins username and password. Let's also try using reload job command. Didn't work. I think we forgot to prepend an at sign for the credentials file, so let's do that. That looks good. We can now read all contents of the file. Based from the amount of output, it looks like the exploit worked correctly since license RTF file really contains huge amount of information. Let's try a few more combinations to get more familiarity. Now the next thing we need to do is to analyze the backend request. I usually use burp, so let's try. I didn't see an option that can allow us to pass Jenkins CLI through a proxy, so let's try using proxy chains. Then from proxy chains, we will then pipe our connection through burp. I have no idea if this will work, but let's try. Let's see if proxy chains is installed. I remember there might be multiple versions, so let's see the available config files. There are two of them, meaning there might be two versions installed. So let's check the packages. Yes, we are right. I assume version four is better, so let's use that. Let's edit the proxy chains for config file and point this to our burp HTTP proxy running on port 8080. Then save this and fire up burp. Burp is up now, so let's run our Jenkins CLI, but prepend the proxy chains command. It now says connection timeout on port 9050, so that means it's using the other proxy chains configuration. Let's try to use the proxy chains ng command and hope it will use the proxy chains config file we just edited. Wrong command this time. Let's hit tab completion to see what we have. Proxy chains 4 seems the right one, so let's use that. Still having connection error. Well, let's just edit that configuration it is trying to use. I'll put again our burp HTTP proxy running on port 8080. Save and try again. 
Looks like it went through this time. Let's go to Burp and see what happened. Based from the headers, it used a WebSocket connection. That may be the reason why we didn't see any other connections aside from this protocol upgrade request. I don't have experience with WebSockets. Although I can learn it at the same time while developing this exploit, I'm worried it might slow me down, so let's try to see if Jenkins CLI can use HTTP connection. One good way to know this is to check the help page of the command. We can clearly see that it can use HTTP instead of a WebSocket. So let's add that option. Our connection seems stuck. Let's go to burp. Now we are seeing standard HTTP requests, which is good, but it is having issues on this last post request. It looks like it is waiting for something from the server, or maybe proxy chains and burp is not really compatible with this type of calls. Let's try to remove them, but use Wireshark to inspect the backend calls. I already have Wireshark running in the background, so let's go check. Here I'm just using a display filter to see all connections from and to the Jenkins server IP. Do note that this is different from Capture Filter. I will show you how to use Capture Filter later. Let's follow the TCP stream of this request. Doing this is a good way to connect the different TCP segments so you will have a nice view of the whole TCP transaction. More on this later as well. It tried to send a GET request to the root path, but obviously it didn't work because we didn't supply it a credential. Nothing too interesting here, so let's look for more. How about this request, which has the actual file content? Notice this download side header. Sending command to Jenkins server involves two parts. One is the upload side, which sends the actual request. And the other is this download side, which fetches the response. This download part doesn't have a post body. So the question is, how do you know on which upload request this corresponds to? Probably via this session identifier. Let's take note of this for now and move on. Looking at the response, there are some odd characters. I don't have an idea what are these, but we will definitely have answers later. Since we saw how the download side looks like, let's now look for the upload side. To make it easier to search, let's look for frames containing the word upload. Starting from the top, we see that it sent the request to exactly same endpoint, and the session identifier is the same. So it looks like it's really using this to link the upload and download requests. This time it included a post body, which is expected, because that is where it included the command and the file we want to read. The body also includes odd characters, and the Jenkins server didn't return anything other than 200 OK. Before we move away from Wireshark, let's save this capture so we can reuse later and name it as HTTP. The file is not really large, so it's OK. I think it's better also to get the upload and download TCP streams in ASCII format and put them in a file, so let's do that. This will be helpful as well if we want to just see higher level details without leaving our terminal. Now that we have our samples prepared, it's time to construct our script. Let's start with the shebang, then followed by useful library imports, requests for handling HTTP transactions, art parse for command line parameters. Let's first set the options we will use. It's always good to provide a nice description of the script, so let's add one. Although not required for this video, it's good to make this script work for Linux as well, so let's add an option for target OS. Before we continue, let's use git version control to track our changes and for easy rollback. Let's go back to the script and add an option for target URL. Finally, let's don't forget to call the parse arg method so we will have access to the actual arguments. Like with my usual scripts, I typically pass this to a proxy so we can easily inspect the backend if needed. Let's name the first request as R1. Then let's build the exploit URL using URL join. And also, don't forget the URL parameters for upload and download requests. Finally, let's build our entire request. Let's do a quick test. It failed because we didn't specify the target URL, so let's make it a required parameter. Failed again due to wrong proxy port. Let's fix that as well. Looks like it went through now. Let's go to Burp. We are hitting 403 forbidden. No idea why. 
probably because we didn't specify the session ID. Before figuring that out, let's make a parameter for target port also. Then make the default as port 88. And let's make sure our target URL is modified accordingly. Now going back to the 403 forbidden, let's try to add a session ID. At this point, we don't know yet how these IDs are generated, so let's try to reuse an old value. This is part of the headers, so let's name the variable properly. Let's rename also other variables properly. Now let's start building the upload payload. I forgot to hit record, but here are the changes I did. I created a separate dictionary for headers we will use for upload. I did this to easily distinguish it with the headers we will use with download side later. Inside this, I specified the session ID, side, and content type, all of which I just copied from Burp. I also started to replicate some of the payload in hex format. This will contain the odd characters we saw a while ago together with the target file name. Right now, this data will be an exact mirror of the one we saw from launching Jenkins CLI. Then once we confirm that this is working, we will make it customizable by making the target file as an option that can be passed onto the script. In order to replicate that payload, we need to create a Python byte object. Then we need to copy the values from Wireshark but use backslash x as separator. This may be time consuming at first, but I'm sure there are quicker ways to do this. Now that we replicate the payload in hex, let's try to execute our request. Let's go to Wireshark and filter again frames containing upload. Let's inspect the TCP stream. Our request is failing. This means the Jenkins server doesn't know how to process our request. Usual suspect is that our payload may be malformed, so let's compare our request to a successful one. The left side is the failed request from our Python script, and the right is the successful one from Jenkins CLI. The length of some rows are different, but in my experience, it doesn't matter as long as the hex values are equal. I think sometimes Wireshark does the adjustment automatically, which sometimes causes confusion. To confirm we have same payload, let's compare some of the bytes. Let's compare two bytes at a time and start at the end. The last bytes looks the same. Let's now try the first 48 bytes of the payload, which is the first three rows. Same as well. But I noticed something different. Were you able to see it also? Take your time and pause the video. This is a good exercise to test your attention to detail. On our exploit, the content length is specified. While on Jenkins CLI, the transfer encoding is set to chunk, and there is no content length. So what is chunked encoding? Is this the reason for our failed request? I guess there is one easy way to find out. That is by adding this on our HTTP headers. So let's do that. Then try again and check in burp. It looks like the header was not applied. Well, I don't see it here. And the arrangement of our payload looks odd. All of them are in one line. Let's try one more thing. That is adding connection keep alive on our header. same issue. I don't think there is any more HTTP header we can try. At this point, we are running out of ideas. If you are in this situation, what would you do? Whenever this happens to me, I either rest if I feel burnt out or try other things which can give me more ideas. 